No, that actually is a really cool story, Michael, and I'm glad you dig the tune. Um, I know some of you people have heard the record, right? Um, and some have not. Um, and Snowbird is, uh, it, it's nine and a half minutes on the... Uh, hey, what's happening, man? Great to see you. It's nine and a half minutes on the record, which is long. That's a long song. It was 15 minutes long. So we cut six minutes out of it. Because, you know, I'm listening to it. We recorded it, and I'm like, this thing is way too long, man. <laughs> um, but it's like, if you don't know it, it's like... Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers and we had just come back from Utah and there's a place in Utah called Snowbird uh, some of you may know it, Snowbird, Utah is a ski resort in the winter yeah, it's a beautiful place and then in the summer they do summer things and they have concerts so we played there, you know Dickie was booked to play there and then we came back and when, for most of my years with Dickie when we would come back and, you know, uh, we'd go back to his house in Sarasota, and I would stay in his guest house. And Dickie uh, is part Native American. His uh, grandmother is Native American, and he was always very involved in Native, Native American causes and things to help Native Americans and befriended like the most important, you know, biggest Native American folks. Uh, and anyhow, when you're in the guest house, you're surrounded with a lot of Native American art and the whole vibe and everything. Anyway, so I woke up one morning. We had just gotten back uh, uh, from Snowbird, and it was like 5 o'clock in the morning. And this is the only time I ever had an experience like this. It was like there was a spirit floating above me. Not that I could see, but it was a presence that I could feel. And I was hearing this melody, just like... And it was plain as day. And I was like, wow, this is so bizarre. I mean, I've dreamt songs, um, but this was like a visitation, and it's the only time that ever happened to me in my life. And it was like some presence just was there in the room at five o'clock in the morning and I heard that melody. And so I had to call it snow, but that's where we just came back from. That's pretty wild. And uh, it is wild. <laughs> and then the song, you know, I had, that's all I had. And then I wrote this bridge that's really... It's really unusual, you know, like it goes off in this, you know, these chords. You know, it's very different. And then it makes it back to the... And to me, that part sounds Native American also. It's, it's very Appalachian. Where does the inspiration come from? Um, it really comes from all kinds of different things. I think that most of the time, uh, it's like you you want to um, be open 
like in terms of um, just being in a musical frame of mind, like on a, in a musical wavelength. Like when you're playing, you're just, you know, you're just feeling musical. And I didn't use any other word to describe it. And melodies and chords and things will just sort of come to you from listening. Like you could play, you could play one note. Like you could go. And it might inspire you to go. Right, so I guess that's the concept right there. Just uh, play, for just me, play it's one like, note, gives you something to yes. revolve like over. Yeah, it's not common that I'm going to hear, I'll be inspired to write a song from listening to another song. But, uh, separate from that, those songs that I've heard, they're all in my mind. So I might start to play something that reminds me of, of a song or of something. And, um, Although I can't think of a single example <laughs> of that, like really happening. Um, I don't know. You know, it's um, it's very abstract. It's like you just pick up on this feeling on the vibe and you start to try to um, act on it in a creative way and, and make something out of it. Right. Reflect into it. But you know what? I, I should say though that, like the title track of this record, Light of Love. Um, and there's some other songs on the record, like Save Something For Me. Um, an emotion, an emotional state, state of mind that I was in, that's what inspired the music, because I was feeling a certain way. So you start to play, and then you try to connect to that feeling uh, while you're playing. So in um, Light of Love, build on this, you know, and in the, in the case of Light of Love, Light of Love is, is a lot like Little Wayne, and Little Wayne is this one set of chords, that's it, and then it just keeps cycling, and it's, the original record is two minutes and 28 seconds long, it's so short, but I mean, you know, it's one of Jimi Hendrix's most beloved compositions. You, it's it, almost impossible to uh, acknowledge in your mind it's a two minute song it's Little Wing, it's like this thing it's like unbelievable um, so Light of Love was like like that in the sense of once I had that, what I just played I just felt I, it didn't need a pre-chorus and a chorus and a bridge like it, you know you um, uh, I mean there's so many great songwriters talk about what happens when you write songs with Keith Richards Keith Richards, for example, said, you know, songs are like children and they show up and they let you know what they need. They tell you what they need and then you have to address the needs of this newborn thing. And sometimes they just show up completely, they don't need anything. Like they're just there. Those are the, ni the nicest ones. The nicest ones are the ones that I dream. And then I wake up and this, and that, and that happened the other day. We're gonna to try to play a song I dreamt two days ago. So. Nice. Nice. Um, is this the first album where you've done all the songwriting? Um, my first record from 1999 called Pusha is uh, ten songs, and I think eight of the songs are. I can't even remember. I think eight of the songs are originals. 
and there's two covers. Um, so that first record was almost all original. And then I put a live record out that was eight songs and only two originals, so it was mostly covers, but I think that's because it was a live record, so we were used to, you know, when we played live, we played a lot of blues songs and, you know, different stuff, so. Um, but I mean, this, there's a reason why this is a double album and it's 18 songs and it's all this stuff, and the songs, some of the songs go back um, 27 years, 28 years, they just never came out. Um, so, uh, you know, I just made the decision. COVID had something to do with it because there was no gig. So I thought, all right, you know, this is the perfect time to get really involved in all the work. It's a lot of work. Four and a half months once I made the decision, four and a half months of going to the studio uh, multiple times a week, you know, 12 hours at a time obsessing you know the OCDism is not I mean when you're on when you're working in Pro Tools the smallest increment of volume that you could change something is a tenth of a decibel okay point one and I'm not joking I would look at Bob Stander the engineer and I'd go you know the snare is like a little loud like can you turn it down one tenth of a decibel and he would go all right I mean, it's, he can't hear the difference. <laughs> and then an hour later, I go, that's kind of low. Turn it back up a tenth of a decibel. And then multiply that by every single sound that there is on every song of 18 songs. He's still alive, he didn't kill you. Say what? He's still alive, he didn't kill you. It didn't kill you. No. <laughs> what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, But you know what? All that, what in the in final analysis, I'm so happy with this record. Like, there isn't a second on the record that I don't like, which is kind of amazing. You know, like, I'm so glad that we and Bob was willing to do it. You know, uh, there's a song on the record called Wonder. It's a very interesting song. It's, it's sort of jazzy. Um, I'm going to screw it up. It's like. <laughs> It was called Wonder because it reminded me of Stevie Wonder when I was writing it. But there's this totally weird section in the middle that, that I hadn't finished, like the original demo. It goes to this part in the middle that's like... It's really pretty. finish that we got to, you know so that that'll be like this little crazy midsection in the song and I had no idea what chords I'd even play so at like two in the morning I'm listening to going what chord is that? what what is that how do you do that on the guitar <laughs> sitar and he goes yeah and then he's like what we're starting like a whole new thing now at 1 30 in the morning I'm like yeah get the electric sitar and so we created this section in the middle uh, the electric sitar has these drone strings on it that you know if you remember those doorbells it had the big um, vertical you know, like brass tubes coming down, and it would always like be really totally out of tune, you know. That's what these drone strings sound like. It sounds like an attitude doorbell. <laughs> and so I made sure I put like two of those, you know, right and left, opposing each other. 
And um, and so anyway, this, the thing is that every song was just another little uh, world, little opportunity for something to try to do something creative and, and musical in the song. That's fantastic. Where did the uh, album title come from? What I love. It just came from the song, you know, that's a song that I wrote probably in 1997, like that. So, um, what is part of that? I, I took, well, the, the lyrics of that song, it's, it's a pretty sad song. And it's a song about, um, you know, your relationship is not going that great. <laughs> and so, if, you know, I say, you know, there you are and there you go. What's in your heart? I wish I could know. Um, do you want the same things as me? Uh, love of life and a soul running free. And uh, and this picture is painted in the first two verses. That's that's pretty sad. But then, because I'm a very optimistic person, I made the third verse. There we are, and there we go, and shine a light, and your love will surely grow. Two are one, and one are we. Unlock your heart, and love is the key. So you can start crying now if you want to. Uh, perfect for uh, Valentine's Day. But I, so I took that picture on the cover. If you showed the people, so that picture is from my kitchen, uh, the sunset. And as soon as I took it, I thought, well, that's going to be the cover of the album. Wow, and, the, and I'm going to call the album Light of Love. And so beautiful. having taken the pictures with, cool. you know, nice. made the decision for me. Cool. There's a few songs in this album um, actually remind me of the Red Hot Chili Peppers um, a little bit. Um, what inspired that? Where did that come from? I forget what tracks it is, though. Like, there's one song, and, and Mike, Mike really digs this song. The song Lost and Lonely is very chilly and peppery. And, um, <laughs> and I, 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 well, I mean, I love the chilly peppers. And, um, you know, for you trivia buffs, John Frusciante and I have the same birthday. So there's something, there's something in that, right? Yeah. We're both March 5th. Nice. And if you go on YouTube and put in John Frusciante lesson, you can you'll see a video of him and his hair is real long and he's sitting on a brown couch. That's with me. So you can't see me. You can hear me talking. And um, John's the coolest. And he wanted us to play together. And he was actually upset that we couldn't play together. The amp had one input and it didn't have two inputs. And he was like, "Oh man, this sucks." So we didn't get to play together. But I inter I've interviewed John a few times. Um, the chili pepper thing in that song is something that I had no awareness to at all. Nothing. The song starts with this, like, um, let's see. Oh, do you have a question? I was just going to ask you, uh, what was it like working with the Allman Brothers Band? 
Okay, so I didn't really get to work with the Allman Brothers well, band. You were Diggy I was with Diggy Betts for ten right. years. Yeah, um, I did play with the Allman Brothers band one time. Uh, Warren Haynes uh, is a guy that I met. Um, there was a club in the city called Chicago Blues on 13th Street and 8th Avenue, and we used to play there a lot in the 90s. And so in the really early 90s, um, I can't remember if it was a night that we had played or if I was just there. And there was this guy there, and we just started talking. It was Warren Haynes. And so he, you know, the, the Allman Brothers thing, the re reformation of the Allman Brothers with Warren was still like just three years, you know, in the making. And he was a super nice guy, and that's when I got to know him, extremely nice guy. And then fast forward, you know, I'm a writer, many of you know, I wrote, been writing for guitar magazines and Guitar World in particular for 27 years. So Warren, you know, I knew from being a writer, and, but what's interesting is like, a lot of these guys met me as a writer, they didn't know I played guitar, and then I play, and, and then they, like the way I played, I started playing with them too, which was great. And so, anyhow, I was at Warren's apartment in 2003, and he said, well, you know, they were doing their march around the Allman Brothers, and he invited me, very kindly invited me to sit in with the Allman Brothers. And it was really exciting, as you can imagine. You know, like while I was waiting to play, like Greg is right here. And I'm sitting like here, and there's Greg. I was gonna say, we're both Greg, okay? No, I was like, <laughs> and so then when I played, I stood between, like Greg was here, and Derek was here, and Warren was over there, and it, you know, it was, when we played, uh, You Don't Love Me, and I mean, it was at the Beacon, you know, so this is great, what can I say, you know, yeah. um, I bought, you know, nice. uh, you know, All My Brothers Live at Phil Maurice when I was 15 years old in 1971, and learned to play slide listening to Dwayne, and, um, but um, after Dickie got fired in, in 2000, I met him to write a story for Guitar World, sent him my first CD, the one I mentioned, um, put a sock in it. And the first track on that record is, is a cover of a Freddie King co song called The Stumble. And so I was talking to Dickie on the phone and I said, can I send you my CD? He said, sure. And you know, because I'm such a typical good businessman slash musician, I totally forgot that I even sent it to him. And so I call him and he had it and I think he was expecting me to ask him about it. And we talked for a while and I go, all right, man, well, good talking to hang up, you know. And so a few phone calls into it, he goes, I got your CD, you know. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. And he goes, man, that first song will knock, knock your hat in the lake. And I said, I said, I hope that's a good thing. And uh, so I said, now I gotta go get my hat out of the lake. And uh, so I said, if there's ever a chance to, to sit in with you, it would be great, it would be an honor. And I mean, he, no one ever said this. You know, I've met a lot of guys and I've had the chance to play with a lot of guys. Dickie said to me, any show that you can make, that you can show up at, call Mike, you know, my stage guy in the afternoon, tell him you're coming. There'll be a half stack Marshall waiting for you. Any show that you can come to. And so for a good two to three years, it was like I drew like a 150 mile circle, like my house in the center, 150 miles. If it fell within that circle, I was going. And so maybe like 20 times or something, I went and sat in with him. And then the last time was at Ridgefield Playhouse. Um, <laughs> was it Will? Was it, was it the one where I did, I, he, I stayed on stage like the whole second yeah, set? Yeah, and brought Mike Bettis up and everybody from the Mikey. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, 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 not not that show. Bets at the yeah, Ridgefield yeah, Playhouse I brought Mike. Oh, I brought Mattis back. You brought him back? No, he stayed over at my house. He stayed with us. Oh, you get me all confused. <laughs> we brought the crew. Up. Yeah, when Mike Mattis was on stage with the Bets, I remember yeah, that. Not, not, not. Anyway, I think it was a Ridgefield. Um, you know, it would always be two songs, and now this has been three years that I've been doing this. And um, 
So I do the two songs, and you know the, the you know the thing is you don't want to overstay your welcome. You know like that's the worst thing you could do. So you know the second the second song was over, I started taking I started taking up my guitar, and Dickie goes like this. He just goes like this, like don't go anywhere. So I was like, all right. So we played another song, and then I, you know, you don't want to be the thing that doesn't leave. That's like the last thing you want to do. And he goes like this again. And I'm like, and then we played a song called Nobody Knows, which is incredibly complicated. If anybody knows that Allman Brothers song, it's a fantastic song, and it's really I didn't know it at all. So I'm up there like I don't know how this goes, and um, and then he wouldn't look at me like the whole rest of the gig. Like I keep looking at him for the, and he refused to look at me. So I'm just playing, and then. He pointed at me to take a solo, and I started taking a solo, and then he came over and he put his arm around me while I was playing the solo. And I have a picture of that. And it was like, and then a month later, he called me and asked me to join the band. So I had no, I think he already had made this decision when he was like, just stay there, you know? And I, maybe it was a little bit of a test too, you know, like, let's see how he does. Yeah. Throw him in the deep end. Yeah. He drowns. Then you know, then he, he, yeah. it's over. Yeah. I remember a few yeah. licks that Dicky That's forgot right. too. So at the same time, he was screwing up a little bit here and there too. So. Dicky Bell's made a mistake. That never yeah. <laughs> He wrote the songs. He can't make a mistake. That's true. That's true. Anyhow, um, but uh, there is a song on the record that was recorded with Double Trouble. Uh, and as many of you know, and, and a bunch of you bought the book today, uh, I wrote a biography of Steve Ray Vaughan. Stevie was a guy I got to know really well. Stevie played this guitar every time we got together. There's pictures of Stevie playing the guitar in the book. And um, uh, so I met Double Trouble back in the 80s. Stevie died in 1990. And then after he died, I, you know, of course, was interviewing Chris Layton the drummer and Tommy Shannon, the bass player, about this terrible tragedy. And then they formed the Archangels in 92, so I interviewed them to do stories about the Archangels, and then they formed Storyville. So through the 90s, I was talking to them and getting to know them better, and I was sending them, in particular, this one song that's on Put a Sock, and it's the second song, is called I Got a Thing About You, and they both really dug that song. And they were making a record with Buddy Miles at the time. This is in like 96 or 7. And they wanted to put the song on the album. And they called me and said, we like this song a lot. We want to do it on the Buddy record. So it didn't make the record, unfortunately. But the good part was right after that, they started calling me to, to I did their instructional videos with them. And I started to do gigs with them and do recordings with them. And then that led to... This, the Jimi Hendrix tribute tours because we in 2000 we did this show at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and there was music all day long all these different bands and then we were the headliners which was Double Trouble Chris Lake Tommy Shannon me on guitar and Malford Milligan singing the singer from Storyville that and we you know I mean we weren't a band you know it was just like I showed up in Cleveland and it's like what songs were we playing Smash Girls of Magic Manic Depression Angel I don't live today. All Hendrick stuff. And um, we're in the dressing room, and all of a sudden, Mitch Mitchell, Jimmy Hendrix's drummer, you know, like one of my biggest heroes of life, walks in, never met him before, and Billy Cox, Jimmy Hendrix's bass player. And me and Tommy were jamming. Tommy was playing bass, and Billy just grabs Tommy's bass. And it's interesting, you know, Mitch Mitchell and Billy Cox to Chris Layton and Tommy Shannon are like their heroes too. You know what I mean? Like they're also like, oh my God, it's Mitch Mitchell and Billy. Like they you know to, to Chris and Tommy also. So Billy just looks at me and he goes, I heard about you. And he takes Tommy's bass and for the next hour and a half, we just played Hendrix songs. Like all the crazy ones. We played Isabella and Freedom and um, Earth Blues and uh, uh, Message to Love and Power of Soul and Astro Man, like the, all the hard ones. And um, 
So then we had to walk out and play. So I was like on cloud 9,000. <laughs> and I walk out and somebody goes, oh, this is Al Hendricks, this is Jimmy's father. So I'm like, Whoa. and Al was like right there. And one of the songs we did was I Don't Live Today. And they asked me to sing it. So I'm singing I Don't Live Today and Jimmy's father is like right over there. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, man. Like, this is too much. Um, and so, and then that led to me playing with Double Trouble on the Jimmy Hendrix tribute tours. And then all the people that came, you know, the special guests on those tours, like Paul Rogers from Bad Company, nicest person in the world. The guy just opens his mouth and sounds like Paul Rogers on any record. It's like, it's like nothing. It's absolutely nothing for him to sing the greatest rock singing you've ever heard in your life. You could just see it's nothing for him. Um, Jerry Cantrell from Allison Chains, nicest guy in the world. Carlos Santana did the Warfield show with us. He was the greatest guy. You know, I mean, all this stuff is crazy, right? And um, anyway, in 2003, about Double Trouble asked me to come to Austin to do a recording session with them. We got to the end of the session and the engineer said, well, you're done, you did everything. And there's an extra half hour. So I looked at Chris and Tommy, I said, can we record one of my songs? And they said, yeah, show it to us. I showed them the song in literally like one minute. And it's on the record and the song is called Have Mercy On Me. And we just did it, no vocal, you know, rhythm guitar, bass and drums, totally live, one time. It's a five and a half minutes on, it took five and a half minutes to record, you know, like, and go. And then five and a half minutes later, we stopped. And we walked in the control room to listen. And Tommy had his bass and he said, there's like two or three spots I didn't really play exactly the right thing. Let me punch those in, punched him in. And I held on to this session for like 18 years or something like that, waiting to finish it. And just a couple months ago, because the uh, bed track, rhythm guitar, bass and drums was totally live from start to finish. Like other than Tommy fixing those little spots, it's live. I wanted to put a live lead vocal, lead guitar, like you hit record and you just, just like a gig, you just sing and play from the beginning to the end. Five minutes later, you know, it's over. That's, you, 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 tra you traveled your little trip. And um, there was a couple spots where I forgot how to play and it was horrible, so we had to fix those. But I would say about 85% of it, at least, was just this story that was told from the moment the song starts. And you get that feeling. So to enter the name dropping part of the evening, um, I sent the song to uh, a couple of guys that uh, have become friends. Um, Joe Perry from Aerosmith is a great guy, and a, a guy I've gotten to know really well. And we get together and play, and he's just, he's terrific. And he heard it, he freaked out. He said, that's the best singing and playing I've heard in a long, long, long time. And Joe Bonamassa said, uh, that track is killer. It sounds totally live, and that's so hard to capture in the studio, something that sounds completely live. And so that's a really cool track, and there's a good story to that track, too. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. free. It came to me. Didn't cost you too much. <laughs> no, they didn't charge me. That's true. Don't say that too loud. No, don't put that on the internet. I'm joking. And it's so funny. I sent that finished track to Chris and Tommy. They, they couldn't be more different from each other as people. And then Chris was playing with Kenny Winchester at Town Hall. I don't know where Sammy is, but we we had done a gig, uh, say I'm the drummer, we had done a gig earlier at Rockwood, and then we went up to Town Hall. And then after the show, I saw Chris, and uh, I said, uh, so you know, when I sent you guys the track, you know, I heard from both of you, you know, I, I heard from you, but I heard from Tommy, too. And Chris was like, oh yeah, oh, Tommy, Tommy, uh, you know, responded when you reach out to him. And I go, uh, yeah. So he goes, well, what did he say? And I go, oh, it's exactly, you know, like what you said versus what he said is exactly what you would think. I go, Tommy wrote, sounds amazing, man. It's beautiful. I love it. Keep up the good work. 
And he, Chris is looking at me and he goes, well, what did I say? And I go, you gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris is looking at me like, yeah, he's just shaking his head. Any opportunity to break balls, you cannot. And I just thought of a story. I don't think I could tell it. It's too dirty. Anyway. Um, we have a lot of, you know, a lot of funny stuff on the road. This, I can tell this is so stupid. We were, we were doing a Jimmy Hendrix tribute tour and then hanging out and the bus is rolling. We're headed to the next town. And now everybody decides, okay, we're going to go to sleep. We're all going to crawl in our bunks and go to bed. And so we're standing in the little, when, you know, if you've been on a tour bus, you know that the second two thirds of it, you open the door and that's where all the bunks are. And so we're standing there getting ready to climb in our bunks. And Tommy just goes, uh, okay, good night. And he starts climbing in his bunk. So I start climbing in the bunk behind him, like with him. But he can't see me, he has his back to me. So he's climbing in the bunk, and I'm climbing in the bunk too. And then he turns, he sees me, he freak, totally freaks out, he's just pushing me out. And I'm going, Tommy, don't you love me? You know, it's just anything to be as stupid as possible is the most important thing of all. So anyhow, um, anybody else? Did you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, I know Wyatt's song is for your son. That's right. And I know for me, when I listen to music, it, I attach it to a memory, an emotion, okay. or a moment, or it gets very visual for me. So I wonder if you wrote it specifically for him from a moment in time or something that happened. Well, you know what's really funny about uh, this, I mean, is that Wyatt's tune is, it's basically a solo acoustic piece. There is percussion, you can hear uh, Rich Rosh, my drummer, uh, at the time, and he just had like a hi-hat and a snare and brushes, that's it. So you can hear the little stuff in the background. I had totally forgotten that it existed at all. And the first thing that I had to do when I decided I was gonna make this double record was I had to fix all the broken machines, they like the digital A-track machine that the that the multi-tracks were on. That machine had been broken for 18 years. My dad machine, where the things were mixed down and other recordings, that had been broken for 15 years. So I had to get these machines fixed so that I could have access to and hear the music that was on these tapes. So on one of the dad tapes, now that the dad machine was fixed, was this. Uh, list of songs. I mean, I didn't know what anything was. I mean, some of the some of them I'd look and remember. Oh, that was the. But I mean, this stuff went back. I mean, why it's twenty nine, and this is from when he was five. You know, so a little while ago, twenty four years ago, and I see fifteen songs in a row, all written like it's clear that it was the same day. You know, I wrote them all down, all blue songs. Track song number nine is called Wyatt's Tune on the box. And I'm like, what's Wyatt's Tune? I have zero memory of this, zero. And everything else is blues. And I remembered that we, Rich and I were asked to open for James Cotton, who's a legendary uh, blues harmonica player at Chicago Blues, but just acoustic, it's an unusual acoustic guitar and percussion. So we rehearsed. The fact that we rehearsed is unusual, and the fact that I recorded it is unusual. And then who knows why, because I'm not too helpful for answering your question, I have zero memory of any of this. Why it was a good recording, I have no idea either. There was, I know there was no effort put into making it a good recording, and the recording's really good. So I don't really know. I had a really good microphone for but, acoustic but guitar. recorded when he was five. He was five. Okay. And it wasn't even my guitar. Okay. Then I had to remember, I'm like, what guitar is this? And I remember that Bill Bonenzinger, who's a Long Island uh, luthier, had lent me a guitar for the gig. And, and so that's the guitar. And so that song, talk about like a finding a jewel, you know, that I had no idea. And there's no other versions. There's no like demos or work tapes and nothing. There's nothing. And it's all blue songs, and then this Wyatt's tune thing that's very unique. It's an open tuning. It's kind of like Little Martha, but slower, you know, uh, in terms of 
finger picking and melodies going in and out of chords and and then it's a little raga like um it reminded me of Braun Yar uh stop by, yeah, by Jim, jimmy page yeah. from zeppelin three um but that was only in afterwards listening to it and thinking oh this is kind of like Braun Yar, you know because i do a little raga this stuff but what's crazy to me now is now that the record's been out I'll hear from someone and say, my favorite song of the 18 songs is Why It's Tune. And it's like the coolest thing, because it was like, who knew that even existed? And it's very different. It's So when you put together 18 songs, well, a couple things, I don't want to go on and on, but there's two discs, and I looked at it like each one should be a record unto itself. You know, each one, if you took it as uh, on its own, I would hope it would be a good record just by its own. And my uh, uh, template for having the different types of sounds and, and songs and feelings, but have it work, was the Beatles' White Album. Because the White Album to me is really, I mean, you have Helter Skelter, and then you have While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and you have Revolution Number no. 9, and you have Julia, and you have Obla D, Obla Da, and back in the USSR, and um, long, birthday. long, long, what's that? It's saying it's your birthday. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the White Album goes all over the place, but they sequenced it so perfectly, you can't even imagine, you know, um, uh, the continuing, what's it called, the continuing story of Rocket Raccoon, is that what it is? Bungalow Bill. Bungalow Bill, that's what it is. Rocket Raccoon is a different song. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like this rambling, amazing record. A Dear Prudence is on there. So that was my template for like, they, the Beatles, you know, like they did a pretty good job of uh, making it go from song to song. So that's what I was thinking about. And, um, and then when it was all done and listening to it as, you know, objectively, what's in interesting to me is there's so much acoustic guitar, and there's so many harmony vocals, and uh, so it's, there's some, you know, fancy ass, you know, guitar playing, and you know, like the Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa influence on me, you can hear that. But taken as a whole, the record has all this other stuff too, it's really different, so. Anyhow, um, what time is it? Sure, 7 21. All right. What time is it? 7 21. 7 what? 21. 7 21. All right, we can go for another couple minutes if anybody has another uh, question or two. Um, off, off topic from the album, you want to tell that uh, Willie Nelson story? When you <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if you don't All mind, right. You don't no, 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 no. I don't mind. Um, <coughs> After having written the, the Stevie book, uh, people asked me, you know, well, are you going to write another book and what are you going to write about? Or I have so many ridiculous stories. You know, I always feel bad that I have to, you know, subject people to these stories, but then people will say, no, these are great stories. You should write a book about all these crazy stories. I mean, you know, there are some good stories. Um, Jeff Beck pretended to perform oral sex on me. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's a really good story. I, I didn't expect that to happen. It was right after I kissed him. So there was alcohol involved, I have to say. That's a great story. That's a really good story. And Billy, Billy Gibbons was standing right there. And he goes, let me, let me give you my card. He gives me his card and it says, Billy Gibbons, friends with Eric Clapton. That's what his card says. All right, Willie Nelson. So with Dickie Betts, we had a gig in Bangor, Maine. I don't know what year it was. I have no idea. 2007 or 8, something like that. And um, it was a one-off shared bill with uh, Willie Nelson. So it was a late afternoon, and the two buses, Dickie's bus and Willie's bus, were in the parking lot on like the opposite side to the parking lot. So Dickie just gets up and he goes, oh, I'm going to go say hi to Willie. And he walks off the bus and walks across the parking lot. 
and he's about to knock on the door to rule his bus, and he looks behind him, and there's 12 people behind him, because we all followed him, because we were all like, we want to meet Willie Nelson, too. So he, he literally like went, like that. And he knocks on the door, and the voice goes, uh, it's open. And then we open the door, and there's a guy there, and the guy goes, I think he was uh, Willie's drummer. He goes, hey, Willie, Dickie's, uh, Dickie Betts is here. And we hear Willie yell, come on up, I got the shit that killed Elvis. <laughs> How great is that? I'm working the story. I got the shit that killed Elvis. <laughs> so we all get up there, and there's Willie, and he's in the, the booth, and his bus, you know, he, he I'm not sure which one it was because he's known it, like they've done 60 minutes on like Willie Nelson's bus because his, he has his own buses. One of them's called Honeysuckle Rose, and it's a beautiful bus and it's all this beautiful woodwork and you know they're his buses. You know it's not like he rents a bus. He has buses and he actually rents those buses out to other people. His buses are beautiful. So he's sitting there in the booth. He's got this giant mound of weed on the table in front of him. And he's rolling joints with one hand. He's like not even paying attention. It's like nothing. And um, and so we hung out with him for like an hour, an hour and a half, or something like that. And I got to uh, talk to him. And when we were getting uh, ready to leave, and then we sat in with his band. Actually, me and um, the bass player, and I think one other guy from Dickie's band sat in with Willie band for a, a tune or two. But you know. It's, I don't know what to say, just like, you know, Al Hendricks, Jimmy Hendricks' father standing over there and you just keep going like, seriously? Um, Willie Nelson is a little more familiar, you know, like we we all know what he looks like. So that's even weirder in a way, you know, it, there he is, like right there, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's Willie Nelson, like right over there, man, like it's completely crazy. How could that be true? And, um, he had just put out a record, I can't remember the name of it, but it might be called Crazy uh, The Demo Session or something like that. But it's his earliest demos. And it's really, really cool. And there's a song uh, called Opportunity To Cry. I've never tried to play it. Just watch the sunrise. On the other side of town Once more I waited Once more you let me down Opportunity to cry. So the song's called "Opportunity to Cry," and um, and I had just heard that for the first time in my life because it was on this demo session. So I got to ask him about it. You know, I was like, "Willie, tell me the story of Opportunity to Cry." <laughs> uh, and it's just a really cool song with really great lyrics. Um, uh, he says something like, "You know, if I run into you, you know." Uh, I don't know if I'll know uh, wrong from right because I might want to kiss you or kill you on sight. <laughs> and then the next verse is like, well, it's getting late and, you know, maybe I should go home. You know? So, uh, but let me tell you. Oh, and I think it's like, and I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to cry, you know, like it's just so great and amazing. So, yeah, so that was, thank you, Tom. So it was in, insane. And so, it's funny, I was um, texting with a guitar player named Andy Timmons today. I don't know if you guys know Andy Timmons. He's a phenomenal guitar player, a really great guy. And we ended up talking about Peter Frampton for some reason. And we did one shared bill when I was with Betts with Peter Frampton in um, Lansing, Michigan. 
And the guitar player, Audley Freed, who was in the Black Crows, a phenomenal guitar player, was Peter's musical director, guitar player at the time. And it was the afternoon, and there was a knock on the door of the bus, and it was Frampton. And he just came on the bus, he, went, he just wanted to say hi to everybody. The nicest person that you could imagine. You know, he's just the coolest guy. He just came, he's like, hey, fellas, I just want to say hello. It's so cool that we're doing a show together. You know, like, you know what a guy, man. I said, I don't, know what, do, I don't know how to get to catering, so, you know, I want you to show me the way. But yeah. boom, where's my psh? Rip shot. No, what's the other one? Not sure either way. Oh, baby, I love you with. Anyway. All right, uh, Michael, what do you want to do? It's your store. You want to throw everybody out? A little bit. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, you know, let's, let's have some fun until you play. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Let's hear it from Michael. Come on. Yeah. Records. In this day and age, it's really tough having a, uh, doing a retail deal. So uh, if you can, come out here and support his store uh, the best you can. He stole my record collection, I noticed, as soon as I got here. Basically, all my records. I stole my stepdad. <laughs> Thanks, cool. All right, so we're going to take a couple minutes to get the band set up, and if you guys can hang out, we're going to play some songs from the record. If you want to crank that record up, uh, that would be cool. Yeah.